Hey, this is Jeff Hunter. Oh, great. Hey, Jeff. Jeff, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, you sound fun. So, uh, great. <laughs> Jeff, on, on the line we have um, also Julianne, Angela, and Patrick with uh, DOT. Hi guys. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for your patience and forbearance. <laughs> Probably all my angst was transparent to you guys. <laughs> No worries at all. I'm in Red Hook, New York, not Red Hook, Brooklyn. This is Dutchess County, rural, at hey, the Enchanted um, Cafe. Angela, looking at your screen right now, I can see, um, I can see like on the far right, it says next slide, and it says the agenda. It's uh, I um, it's not quite like an <clears throat> Yeah, try that. Yeah. Is this, I don't think that's what I want. Um, I'm hooked up to the projector in a conference room, so it's probably the, the projecting screen. Oh, okay. I know there's a way to do this. I just don't remember. Yeah, other people have run into this before, too. Yeah, there's there it is. Aha, nice. Yeah, perfect. Hey, and Jeff, we're getting a lot of feedback. If you could put yourself on mute. Okay. There you go. Um, let's see. And Cass, my colleague, is going to be joining us here shortly, too. So, any other questions that you guys can think of? Yeah, is that feedback going to be, um, it's off mute obviously right now because you can hear me, is that going to be um, okay during the presentation? How do I sound right now? You sound, you sound okay, not great. There's a little bit of um, background noise, but um, it's not, it's not that bad. I could try to go handheld and take out the Bluetooth buds that I have in my ears, see if that's better. Yeah, try it. it might, as, might as well. And, um, Angela, is for, that any better? Yeah, that's a lot better, actually. Okay, let's do that. Great. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, like before, like you were further away from the, um, the mic, you know, like it, but now it sounds like you're, you're just louder and there's less of an, um, it's just better. Um, Angela, for right some on. reason, um, I can see like your little bar on the far right, your, the go to webinar bar. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there, that got rid of it. That just moved it. So awesome. Okay. Perfect. And, and Brian, this is Cass, I'm on as well. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, Julianne, Angela, Patrick, Jeff, meet Cass partner in crime with Park Service here. <laughs> Hello. Thanks so much for presenting, guys. This is an exciting webinar to have. Okay. Yeah. We hope we don't disappoint. It's going to be great. Much so, appreciated. So just heads up, um, we accidentally hit the start uh, broadcast. All right, it is 3 o'clock Eastern time, so let's get started. Welcome and thanks for joining today's presentation on the Department of Transportation's ecological planning process. My name is Brian Fainer, and I'm with the 
Park Service and helps support the NPS's Connected Conservation effort. The Connected Conservation webinar series focuses on how NPS staff and partners can use various tools and strategies to conserve NPS resources at the landscape and seascape level. We host a webinar at least once a month, and you can find recordings of past webinars on our internal Connected Conservation Toolkit, which is accessible to all DOI staff and the Network for Landscape Conservation website. The webinar series is open to other federal agencies, state agencies, NGOs, and other partners. And you can find links to both the uh, internal Connected Conservation uh, Toolkit um, and the Network for Landscape Conservation uh, page in the chat box. We will post today's webinar following the presentation to both of those sites. Um, and throughout the presentation, feel free to plug in questions into the questions box. We will host a question and answer session following the presentation and read those questions to the presenters. Um, today we have uh, four presenters actually. Um, Julianne Schwartzer is the Chief of Policy Analyst, Analysis and Strategic Planning at the U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe Center. Uh, Julianne has worked at Volpe since 2007 and her technical work focuses on environmental permitting and regulatory reform, infrastructure project delivery, acceleration, and mediation and facilitation. Angela Berthalm uh, joined Volpe Center in 2017 as a technology policy analyst and she supports a variety of programs including the Federal Highway Administration Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty the Intelligent Transportation Systems Joint Program Office, Pro Professional Capacity Building, the, the National Park Service, and the Office of Secretary of Transportation. Patrick Welsh joined Volpe in 2016 as a community planner in the Policy Analysis and Strategic Planning Division. In this role, he works with agencies across the Department of Transportation to support environmentally sustainable, economically efficient, and safe transportation decisions. And finally, Jeff Hunter, is a senior program manager for the National Parks Conservation Association in Asheville, North Carolina, where he works on issues relating to Great Smoky Mountains National Park, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and the Appalachian National Scenic Trail. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Julianne and her team. Thank you very much. Um, so we're very excited to present to you today about the ecological program, or really more broadly about ecosystem scale infrastructure um, and conservation planning. And I'm going to start by giving you a brief overview of the ecological program and concept and talk a little bit about the applicability to the National Park Service. Um, then we'll move into a couple of case examples. First, the I-40 corridor wildlife crossings, which Angela and Jeff will share with you, and then an example from the Maine Department of Transportation. So what is ecological, you may be asking yourself. Um, it essentially, at its core, is a landscape scale approach to considering conservation mitigation and infrastructure development on the landscape. And really, at its core, what this means is bringing all the right people, so all the right agencies and stakeholders to the table early to talk about where different things fall or could fall in the future across a wide-ranging region. Um, and then to identify places that are ripe for conservation, areas that are opportunities for mitigation, and places where development of infrastructure, whether it be in our case mostly transportation, but other things such as you know energy, utilities, et cetera, could exist on the landscape. So just to share with you a little bit about the background of ecological and how it came to be, um, in the late 1990s in Montana, the concept of that I've just described to you was something that people were chatting about. It was kind of a different time in terms of road development. People were thinking about developing big new roads. That concept has changed a little bit given what had happened over time. Um, but folks in Montana were sitting around discussing the opportunity, or I guess I should say, the need to capitalize on vanishing opportunities to preserve wide swaths of unexploited landscape. Um, and your own Amanda Hardy is deeply engaged in this effort in which Montana brought together its resource and infrastructure agencies and federal land management agencies to talk about this concept and figure out how to put a framework around preserving the landscape whilst allowing for development. 
At that time, the Federal Highway Division Administrator in the Montana Division Office recognized the significance of what was going on in her state and also its connection to what was going on in the national policy dialogue on these issues and raised this issue up to headquarters as a model and an opportunity to do something at a national scale. Headquarters is really excited about the concept and listened and then convened eight federal agencies to sit down and talk about how do you make the dream of ecosystem scale infrastructure planning a reality. Um, so over, between 2002 and 2006, the eight agencies normed and stormed and formed and came to develop the document which we call ecological and ecosystem approach to developing infrastructure projects. And we'll have some links at the end in case it's something you haven't seen and would like to take a peek at. As part of that, all of the agencies signed the cover page of the document in a sort of, I guess I would say, um, agreement that this is something that each agency really believed in and believed in the collaboration inherent in the approach. So after that, um, the agencies all kind of took the concept in their own direction. Each agency did its own thing, and this is sort of what you see on your screen is a list of all of the different expressions of each agency of ecosystem scale approaches. And at the same time, sort of the verbiage surrounding this changed a little bit and morphed. So some places continue to call it ecosystem scale. Other places call it landscape scale, watershed approach is something that's commonly used as well. All these things basically roll up to the same concept that we're bringing the right people and the right data together to make smarter decisions. Just to give you a little insight into what Federal Highway did during this time, um, after the sort of formation and release of the document, the Federal Highway Administration launched into a, a series of grant and research programs in which they provided resources to places around the country to attempt to make this approach happen in practice whilst performing high-level important research to understand exactly what kind of savings um, and opportunities were produced. One sort of aspect of that was something called the Strategic Highway Research Program, or the second Strategic Highway Research Program, through which Congress directed the Department of Transportation to fund the Transportation Research Board, which is part of the National Academies, to examine the subject further. And they produced a couple of large documents on the subject further exploring how to really make this vision a reality. So, what are the benefits of ecological? So really, like, why is this something to do? It's multi-parted, as you can see from looking at your screens. But the key really is that we're finding ways to save time and money, but at the same time to yield better environmental outcomes. So. By doing all of these activities up front to understand what's going on and what we want to do, we're saving time in the process of developing infrastructure projects or mitigation opportunities. But at the same time, we're saying this big area is right for conservation and there's no need to put infrastructure through it. Or alternatively, this area really needs restoration and there's a great mitigation opportunity and there's a project in the same watershed or ecosystem that really could contribute to the restoration of that area. Um, so you're kind of seeing the dual benefit there. In addition, there's other things, um, including increased buy-in by bringing everyone to the table earlier, really knowing that you're improving your relationships across agency through these types of large processes, um, and improving efficiency and transparency in your processes. So how do you apply ecological? Ecological, the document itself, and then the subsequent research produced a nine-step process, which I will not go through with you now, um, but essentially it does what I described. It's really the process of getting everyone to the table, getting all the information together, sharing all the information, and then making smart decisions with it. One of the terms, though, that I think is useful, that's worth sharing, um, is the regional ecosystem framework, which essentially is this idea of taking natural resource information, cultural resource information, and the infrastructure information and putting it all in one place overlaid, either via a tool or geospatial analysis. Um, 
software to really look at everything together. And maintaining this regional ecosystem framework over the life of the dialogue that occurs between the agencies is really of critical importance because that's how you are all seeing in a transparent way what's going on and using it for decision making. One of the really exciting things about ecological, although its origins are in the late 90s, it's really been featured in and supportive of major cross-government initiatives, cross-administration, aimed at accelerating project delivery while improving environmental outcomes. And this is just like a smattering of the things that it's contributed to over the past several years, but something for that I think is of particular significance for the Park Service audience is that it's definitely because it's proposing a lot of activities that happen pre-NOI, it's in support of the one federal decision, um, which is baked into Executive Order 13807, but also the secretarial order, which sort of calls for similar acceleration of project delivery. You're moving a lot of the dialogue before the projects are even identified. And so therefore you are able to really make these decisions early so that when you get to the actual projects, you're able to move through them in a much faster manner. So is ecological feasible for the National Park Service? We say yes. Um, I, one of the things that's always struck me about the way that the Park Service operates relative to this concept is that as an agency, there's an opportunity to really wear more than one hat in the process. On one hand, you're responsible for the preservation of resources, um, but you're also responsible for access to some of those resources by the public. And so you both play the conservation role and also are responsible for the maintenance and at times construction of infrastructure. So having a holistic approach like this is really, I think, suited to the structure of the organization um, and some of the cases that we'll talk about, I think you'll be able to see yourselves in. So Federal Highway and its partners have put together a lot of resources in the past several years about ecological, really things that are how-to guides. Um, and this is a short list of some of them here. And I'm gonna turn things over to Angela and Jeff to tell you a little bit more about how sort of the big picture approach that I just described is modeled in practice. Great, thanks Julianne. So Jeff Hunter from the National Parks Conservation Association had contacted Federal Highway for support and technical assistance for the I-40 corridor region. The National Park Conservation Association described some of the wildlife connectivities and other issues that they were having in the region, and Federal Highway provided some information on ecological and determined its applicability for the current challenges in the region. So the groups decided it would be helpful to move forward with uh, peer exchange in the fall of 2018 to help the region define the goals and develop next steps. So we have Jeff with us today and he can provide more background and discuss the current status of the efforts and describe how the ecological program has been applied to the issues in the region. So Jeff. Thank you, Angela. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, yeah, it's, it's, first of all, I just want to start off by saying um, what a pleasure it was to work with ecological and um, just emphasize how much value they brought to our project. Um, it was tremendous. Uh, a little bit of background, so if you're not familiar with National Parks Conservation Association, we're an NGO, uh, we advocate to protect and enhance America's national parks for present and future generations. We celebrated our centennial last year, so we're in the, we're in the second century of our existence. Um, and at this point in time, you know, parks are visited at a rate that has never before been seen. They're more crowded than ever. Uh, many of our parks are surrounded by high-speed roadways. Um, the parks have capacity issues in terms of managing visitation. So um, this is not just a unique issue in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I'm sure wherever you look around the country, there are wildlife vehicle conflicts around national parks to one degree or another. And we're going to focus on the I-40 project near Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a photograph from the ecological workshop that was held in Maggie Valley, North Carolina in October. And at that point in time, this collaborative project, and it is very much a collaborative project, so I'm talking about it, I have the privilege of sort of leading this collaborative effort, but I also have the privilege of working with federal, state, tribal, and non-governmental organizations, a bunch of them. 
Uh, and we couldn't accomplish this without working together because it's a multi-jurisdictional landscape. And Ecological brought us instant credibility. They brought people together to the table in good faith and really at a critical point in the project. And what you see here is people uh, gather around a project area map um, talking about different aspects of the project. And this is one of a number of different breakout groups that, it, that occurred at the end of day two on this two-day wildlife crossing workshop. Uh, next, please. So this just gives you an idea of some of the many stakeholders that we have here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Wildlands Network. Um, National Parks Conservation Association and Wildlands Network have field biologists that are working in partnership. Uh, Dr. Liz Hillard with Wildlands Network and Steve Goodman with NPCA. They're doing a lot of our on-the-ground research, but we couldn't do that research without help from the state wildlife agencies, and we are dealing with a project that's in the state of Tennessee and North Carolina. So we have two wildlife agencies. We have uh, U.S. Forest Service lands, two different forests in two different states. We, have, of course, have the National Park Service. We have land trusts involved. Um, we have uh, tribal interests, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, um, two departments of transportation, um, lots of NGOs. So you can see the value of having someone like Ecological bring people together to talk about an issue like this in a focused way. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows you a list of the stakeholders. Um, and this list has grown since we first met to discuss this issue in February of 2017. So as I sit here today in uh, late June of 2019, um, this project is not quite two and a half years old, and we really made quite a bit of headway so far. Um, there are also some key individuals that aren't represented here, like Dr. Mike Pelton, who's a, a bear researcher who's been studying bear in this corridor for years, and uh, Dr. Joe Clark at the University of Tennessee. Um, so I don't want to shortchange anybody. There's a, a lot of folks involved, and uh, and that's one of the cool things about this project. Next, please. So uh, our focal species are black bear, uh, elk, and white-tailed deer. Um, we do have a mortality issue right now, a pretty significant one in this corridor with black bear. Um, they are the charismatic, uh, charismatic species in the southern Appalachians. Uh, when this roadway opened in 1968, uh, the population was a fraction of the size of what it is today. Uh, regarding elk, they weren't even on the landscape. Uh, they had been extirpated. Um, if you could uh, show this video here, um, click this video, I can't control it, but this shows you one of the issues we have in this corridor. This was um, August, a Sunday afternoon in August of last year, uh, and it shows you both the wildlife peril and the safety issue for humans, um, because what you're seeing here is cars stopped on an interstate right in the heart of our project area, and um, a sow and three cubs crossing I-40 right near the Tennessee, North Carolina state line. Uh, it doesn't always end this well, though. Next slide, please. Uh, this is often what we see is mortality. One of the causes of mortality is the Jersey barrier, that concrete barrier between the east and westbound lanes. Uh, the adult bears can often climb over it. The cubs have a challenge doing so. Um, often cubs and adults get separated and uh, the results are what you're seeing here. Um, but we do have very large bears in, in this um, landscape and you could have a four or five, 600 pound bear uh, in the roadway, which is very much a safety issue for motorists. Next slide, please. Uh, here's elk. They were reintroduced in Cataloochee. Uh, which is a valley in the national park. One thing I want to make clear is that this particular project is taking place outside park boundaries. So um, I, I'm so grateful that our park colleagues in Great Smoky Mountains National Park are able to um, put some staff time towards this because they have enough to occupy their time inside the boundaries of the park. But recent studies have shown that bear, most bears in the park have to leave the park at some point in time to fulfill some part of their life cycle, whether it's to find food or find mates or uh, suitable habitat. So um, as the bear population grows, and it is growing, this is an issue. Uh, the elk herd is growing. This is a, a cow and a calf. 
Uh, next slide, please. And we do have a mortality issue on US 19, which is a state highway between uh, Maggie Valley, North Carolina, and Cherokee, North Carolina. We've had three documented um, elk strikes on the interstate. We're not seeing this as a major problem now, but we're trying to be proactive about the situation with elk because their population re recently expanded to both sides of the highway. The herd, we believe, is growing, and so we're trying to get out in front of this before these large ungulates um, uh, result in a, a, in a fatality on this corridor. Next slide, please. And this is what can happen when uh, an elk and a vehicle collide. Um, this is not uh, a photograph from the corridor. This is outside the area, but it's an example of what can happen. A bull elk can run a thousand pounds. And in fact, we did have a 997 pound bull hit on US 19. Thankfully, the motorist um, was not killed. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the corridor. It's a 28-mile corridor, as I mentioned earlier, multiple, multi-jurisdictional. And I'd like to dive into some of the things that have happened um, since we gathered uh, in October of last year, some of the progress we've made, which is directly attributable to, um, I think, ecological involvement in this project. Next, please. So we have some... Um, some study goals, and we're in a research phase right now. And one of the things that Ecological really drilled down to us is the importance of data gathering. Uh, the DOTs are data-driven organizations. They really need good data in order to make decisions. Um, so uh, we're trying to improve our understanding of wildlife activity patterns, uh, mortality, and road permeability. When I say road permeability, where is wildlife successfully able to cross um, the roadway? Uh, mortality tells you where they're not successfully crossing. Permeability tells you where they are successfully crossing. Uh, we don't really have this quantified, so we're trying to get our arms around that. Uh, and Liz Hillard um, with Wildlands Network and Steve Goodman working um, collaboratively are making some great strides in this area. Next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned there's a 28-mile study corridor. There's eight miles in Tennessee, 20 miles in um, North Carolina. One of the outcomes was to have the folks from North Carolina DOT and Tennessee DOT in the same room around the same table discussing this issue. That's what Ecological made happen. Absolutely imperative for us to make um, um, progress on this. And we needed permits from both of these agencies, so we were able to coordinate um, and, and build some momentum, build those important relationships with Ecological's help, and then get out in the field, start getting permits approved, and actually start doing um, on-the-ground work, which involves setting wildlife cameras, um, collaring elk, um, documenting uh, wildlife mortality. Um, next slide, please. And so another thing, uh, we had the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, the North Carolina Department of Transportation, and Tennessee Department of Transportation in the same room. A lot of their mortality data was siloed. So each agency had some information. Um, we were able to gather that and start to put it all together and, and start to build a database. And um, again, that all important bringing people together um, made that happen. So partnerships, uh, uh, resulted, we were able to actually go out and meet with the folks who drive this corridor to help motorists who break down. Uh, NC DOT has a has a crew that goes out, and those folks are now keeping an eye out for mortality for us. Uh, and those relationships were built with Ecological's help. Next slide, please. Okay, one of the things we're trying to do with accessing permeability is to try to determine. Are the existing structures, um, underpasses, uh, culverts, are they being utilized? Um, and so we're getting some really good information. One of the really real challenges here is to measure the barrier effect. Uh, if you're not familiar with the barrier effect, some animals will try to cross and succeed. Some will try and fail. Some will approach the road and never attempt to cross because of the light, because of the noise. That's the barrier effect. It's, it's, you know, it scares them away from attempting to cross, so they can't connect to new habitat, to, to mates, they can't find food. And what we're seeing with some of our uh, surveys is, uh, with cameras, bears approach, they look like they want to cross, 
and they turn around and they go back. They approach culverts. The culvert isn't good for them, so they go up at grade and they cross the road. We're getting some really good data. It's all really preliminary yet, um, but we're starting to see some really interesting things. Next slide, please. Um, another thing we're trying to do is to determine wildlife activity within the right-of-way. Um, uh, Steve Goodman and Liz Hiller designed a study. Uh, we hope to publish these results at some point in time. They basically uh, put together 30, 400 meter uh, survey segments where they placed two cameras uh, in the right of way. Um, we're drowning in data right now, but we have some interns and folks who are trying to keep up with that. And so we're monitoring bridges. We're monitoring a new land uh, parcel that was acquired. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And we're seeing some non-target species like spotted skunk and long-tailed weasels, which is really interesting. Next slide, please. And I'm going a little long, I'm gonna wrap up here. So um, in summary, we've got 105 cameras in the field right now. We've got a couple of them stolen, um, but we, um, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we hope to complete our research in the fall of 2021, um, as well as gathering some data on this Wilkins Creek track. This is a 187 acre parcel that was recently acquired by our land trust partners, the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy, as about a mile of frontage. Um, and uh, we're also, uh, Wildlands Network is leading an elk collaring project. Uh, they're lead on that, they acquire the funding and the resources, and they're directing that project. NPCA, North Carolina Wildlife Federation, uh, are partnered and we're, with the assistance of the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission and the National Park Service, we're putting collars on these animals and we're gaining some really important information, including seeing where some of these animals are crossing the highway at grade. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a track, this is the track I alluded to, the new Wilkins Creek track, the 187 acres acquired. Again, collaborative, the spirit of collaboration led to this kind of acquisition. So uh, a really nice conservation success early on in this project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just want to thank the partners again. Uh, sorry if I went over a little bit, um, but I can't sing ecological, ecological praises enough. Um, They've really been helpful, so thank you. Thanks, Jeff, that was a really great presentation. Um, so next, I just wanted to provide another kind of high-level example of how another agency, in this case, Maine Department of Transportation, has applied the ecological approach uh, to develop a solution that best meets their needs. So for some background, in 2000, uh, the Atlantic salmon was uh, added to the uh, endangered species list, and in 2009 um, had their habitat designated as critical. Uh, so this listing and designation covers about two-thirds of the state of Maine, uh, requiring uh, Section 7 consultation under the Endangered Species Act on hundreds of transportation projects um, overseen by the Department of Transportation in Maine. So this influx required, uh, excuse me, this influx of required consultations created a massive backlog of projects waiting review um, that were creating delays of at least a year on bridge and culvert projects. Um, at the time, less than 20% of consultations were being completed on schedule, and there was a backlog of 40 uh, consultations for Atlantic salmon. And to give you a um, kind of some perspective there, on average, they were completing seven uh, reviews each year. So you had a several year uh, backlog of projects. Uh, so as a result of all this, needed transportation improvements were being delayed, um, increasing the inventory of deficient structures. So with assistance from Federal Highway, Maine DOT uh, utilized the ecological approach to develop a programmatic uh, consultation and in lieu fee program for Atlantic salmon. The programmatic consultation covers bridge and culvert projects within the entire range um, in the state of Maine. Um, it was also the first programmatic consultation for aquatic species um, affected by transportation projects on the East Coast. And it had two primary goals. The first was to ensure the protection of Atlantic salmon and its critical habitat. Uh, Maine has one of the last remaining populations of wild Atlantic salmon in the US and recent population declines have had significant impacts on ecosystems as well as recreation and the state economy. 
The second goal was to reduce this uh, uh, consultation backlog and approval timelines for the salmon related projects. So the next few slides provide an overview of the process that Maine DOT used to develop and implement uh, the programmatic and in loose fee. So as Jeff mentioned and as Julianne mentioned in their presentations, collaboration really is essential um, in the ecological process. So, and, and this is true for Maine DOT, really throughout the programmatic development process, particularly in the beginning phases to assemble all of the partners and get everyone on board. Uh, the slide here shows um, the numerous state and federal agencies that were involved in the development. Um, so in spring of 2015, um, Maine DOT held an ecological workshop that resulted in the creation of this draft consultation schedule with targeted completions of, of critical milestones to include in, in the Section 7 consultation process, um, which was really the, the beginning of the process of creating uh, the programmatic and in loose fee. The agencies continued to meet regularly throughout 2015 and 2016 to discuss um, you know, data needs, um, any issues with the drafting of the programmatic schedules, excuse me, and key deliverables. Um, so in 2017, in January of 2017, um, all of this um, collaboration and effort culminated with um, the final programmatic biological opinion that's in use today. Um, but even after the programmatic was finalized, collaboration continues um, as, you know, through this implementation phase, as uh, progress is monitored and adaptive management strategies are discussed. So early on, the team reviewed data from numerous sources, um, from numerous agencies to review the status of the Atlantic salmon, condition of their critical habitat, and establish an environmental baseline that could inform um, this programmatic and then loose program. So the data was used to estimate the full range of the population um, and critical habitat and divided the population into three um, salmon habitat recovery units. And this environmental baseline was really critical to determine the appropriate mitigation activities um, described in, in some later steps. So the next step of this process was to assess the effects of anticipated transportation projects. So Federal Highway and Maine DOT in close collaboration again with the Fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries, conducted an effects analysis that covered um, eight primary activity categories that accounted for um, really the majority of the projects that they were seeing um, impacting or having possible impacts to Atlantic salmon and requiring consultation. These, some of uh, the major categories included bridge and culvert replacements, bridge scour countermeasures, culvert rehab, and bridge maintenance. And the primary effects that they analyzed included elevated turbidity and sediment, underwater noise, fish handling, and uh, temporary drainage of habitat. So next in the uh, ecological process was prioritizing actions. So in 2015, the team met uh, to develop a tiered priority, to develop, excuse me, tiered priority areas based on all of the information that has been gathered to date. Um, the salmon watersheds were grouped into three tiers. Tier one being the highest value habitat and really the focus of their priority recovery efforts. Tier two were still priority watersheds um, that didn't include current recovery efforts, but could contain populations uh, important for recovery. Tier three watersheds were areas that did not have any documented Atlantic salmon or designated critical habitat. And the objective of this tiering was really to prioritize uh, the facilitation of fish passage and resulted in the development of multiple maps, um, which 
uh, were reviewed and approved by all of the agencies involved to um, kind of further solidify buy-in in the process. So again, all of this work culminated with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service issuing this programmatic biological opinion in January of 2017. Um, and this programmatic addressed transportation act, or addresses transportation activities funded by Federal Highway Administration or permitted by the Army Corps of Engineer uh, throughout the state of Maine. It creates a streamlined approach to Section 7 consultation by defining the effects of general activities that involve working streams and have the uh, potential to impact uh, Atlantic salmon or their habitat. Um, the project scopes range uh, from larger projects, such as bridge and culvert replacements, to smaller projects, such as scour countermeasures, uh, culvert rehabs, or uh, routine bridge maintenance. And what the program programmatic does is outline uh, design standards and avoidance and minim minimization measures to implement during the design and development stages uh, of transportation projects. And to offset any of these adverse effects that are found, um, there's compensatory mitigation that's required, and that's where the MLU fee program comes in. So in 2018, the MLU fee program was fi finalized which allowed both public and private applicants to pay into uh, an in-lieu fee mitigation fund instead of conducting this project-specific uh, mitigation. So applicants pay into the in-lieu fee fund based on the impact attributed to their projects. Um, mitigation fees range from $10,000 to upwards of $200,000 on individual project basis, depending on um, the impacts attributed to those projects. And the in-lieu fee program provides a really great opportunity for re recovery projects that either uh, didn't have enough funds um, to apply and implement these projects. So that's the overall uh, process. And um, really, within the first year of implementation, Main DOT saw really impressive results. Um, primarily, this decreased backlog um, of Section 7 consultations and increased efficiencies. Um, it's not a typo. They saw a 229% increase in the number of complete consultations and completed uh, almost all of their consultations on schedules. There are also significant uh, cost savings in the first year alone, Maine DOT estimated a uh, um, cost savings of around $230,000 um, attributed to, to consultations. So not only is it saving time and money, but it's also resulting in uh, improved environmental outcomes um, and the restoration of really high value habitat access for Atlantic salmon. Um, They've created uh, culvert replacement and stream crossing standards as part of this programmatic to help restore flow and passage by installing appropriately sized culverts that incorporate materials and structures of the existing stream bed. Um, finally, um, there's, they've seen uh, an increase in trust between all agencies involved, uh, resulting in increased communication and uh, further shortening review times. So several years into the programmatic, um, not surprising, Maine DOT and the partners involved have shared several uh, lessons learned and over the years um, learned from these to further um, improve, uh, improve outcomes. The first lesson learned is the need for strong advocates across all agencies. Um, Maine DOT, Fish and Wildlife, and all of the other partner agencies began the programmatic consultation effort with varying goals and expectations. Advocates for the programmatic approach at each agency were key to meeting milestones, um, especially when the group faced roadblocks. Um, second, um, as noted in the previous slide, programmatic approaches save time and money. Uh, Main DOT has seen an increase in project efficiency um, on individual consultations through established protocols for design, construction, and monitoring. 
excuse me. The third lesson learned, clear and consistent communication improves relationships and results. All of the agencies involved reported an increase in morale and overall satisfaction throughout project development and implementation. This is largely due to more frequent communication, clearly identified expectations, and the trust that was built throughout this uh, ecological approach. Um, Main DOT has also been able to reinvest cost savings from individual consultations back into project designs and implementation that improve uh, fish passage for Atlantic salmon and restore um, habitat. So each project they're seeing cost savings uh, in from not having to complete individual consultations, and they're able to take that money and improve the design of their projects uh, to further uh, um, enhance habitat and connectivity. Um, the last two uh, lessons learned deal with uh, ongoing monitoring and adaptive management. So post-construction monitoring of finished projects um, are essential to uh, identify potential issues with water flow, uh, substrate composition, sediment, stability, and really feed into an adaptive management strategy um, that is being used by Maine DOT and the partners uh, to maintain um, kind of appropriate uh, actions and goals in the programmatic. So that was a high-level overview of how Maine DOT has used um, the ecological approach, the nine-step process, uh, to improve the efficiencies of their uh, Section 7 consultations for Atlantic salmon. And with that, um, I believe that's the end of all of our presentations, um, and we can open up for questions and answers if there are any. All right, awesome. Great presentation. Uh, folks, again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions tab that you'll find in your in that little go to webinar bar. I've got a couple questions so I scribbled down while you guys were presenting to start us off though. Um, here's one. There's a lot of wildlife overpasses going up in Wyoming. Um, and it seems like those state DOT, the state DOT there is pretty proactive in, you know, working with the state agencies on, you know, the looking at pronghorn antelope and, you know, uh, other ungulate movements. Are those types, of, is that, or is the state using ecological or are they kind of doing all, all, some of that work by themselves? And, and how often, I guess, does do uh, Federal Highway Administration and DOT you know, work at the state level for some of these wildlife type issues? So I don't know that we we have a, I would, so I would say we have a broad team that works on ecological and I couldn't speak to anything specifically going on in Wyoming right now um, in the state that I'm personally a little less familiar with in terms of their work in this approach. However, um, the Federal Highway Administration participates in state efforts and working towards state adoption of a lot of these principles in a variety of ways. One way directly through the ecological program has been through the grant programs that they've offered, but also just through direct technical assistance opportunities in which states have reached out to Federal Highway at seeking support um, to understand how to apply some of these really innovative approaches um, and engaged in technical assistance opportunities such as workshops and trainings. In addition, um, Federal Highway maintains something called Everyday Counts, which was a signature initiative of a previous Federal Highway administrator and went on to be codified in the FAST Act. Everyday Counts essentially puts forward a series of um, innovations and so the same team at Federal Highway that delivers the ecological program is also really invested in an innovation which is aim was initially, I think, in its onset aimed at synchronization of NEPA 404 and other sort of key components of the environmental review process 
through that, um, different states reached out and requested support in performing gap analyses to understand how to co better coordinate some of these processes. Um, a lot of them tend to be focused on water, but there are some that are definitely focused on ESA issues. And um, and then they go, the team goes out and works directly with that state to help them bring about whatever solution they're looking for. So in some cases that includes programmatic agreements. Um, in other cases, they're sort of bigger, more broad brush solutions. Great. All right, here's, an, here's another one for you guys. Um, does Ecological have a inventory of best practices that deal with different impacts from road infrastructure projects? Yes, absolutely. Um, so if you look at Ecological's website, and honestly, it, it's embedded in something called the Federal Highway Environmental Review Toolkit, but Googling is probably the easiest way to get there. The link that is uh, currently on the screen will take you directly to the ecological website and there's a, a library of case studies um, detailing either specific steps of the ecological process looking at all of the steps holistically uh, providing a lot of the uh, links of a lot of the documents that Julianne was referencing in her overview presentation um, there's a collection of, of presentations from different uh, meetings and conferences um, so there's a, a, a really good inventory of resources um, there that I encourage everyone to, to take a look. Great. All right, I'm get, I got another one here. Does DOT bring money to the table for mitigation, I guess, after, you know, these ecological groups get um, developed and but later on I guess on the tail end does DOT have funding for mitigation I guess I I'd want to kind of defer that question to Mike Ruth of the Federal Highway Administration um, I mean I probably, yeah maybe yes but through I guess through channels that I think he would be better able to describe than we could but um, but if the person who asked the question, if you take down who it was, we'll absolutely work with Mike to get back to you on the answer to that. Okay, great. All right, here's another one. Can any park use ecological? Any park can use ecological. So, um, so various components of the Park Service have been engaged in what we call our signatory agencies group, which is essentially um, representatives from the eight agencies who signed ecological, and um, they meet two times a year to talk through sort of issues facing their agencies. Um, different components of the Park Service have participated over time. So Amanda right now um, is is the sort of designee, but in the past, folks who come more from the transportation planning world have participated and been able to share with us a range of examples from different size and scale parks. Um, I think Golden Gate National Recreation Area was an example that we hadn't necessarily expected as being kind of like a shining example of a place using with not because it's not a fabulous park, of course it is, but just because it's in a more urban setting than some of the other parks. But um, but they really were able to put forward a way in which they were considering like a lot of different resources, bringing different folks to the table and having a dialogue. Um, so I, I think it's really for anyone and everyone, there's always opportunities to consider all of the factors up front and, and work together to make good decisions. Great, and you sort of already answered this other question, but have, uh, are there, what parks have used this process or are there any parks that have used this process yet? So, so yes, um, and I, I'm looking quickly on our website as well, just for some of the resources that Park Service have put forward in the past. But we can we can work to make those available to you. Um, it seemed through some of some of the programs that you guys have had in terms of cataloging your data that you've really, in some de facto ways, been bringing that information to the table and working with partners. Um, BLM also had, and I know this isn't directly answering your question, but had done a lot of work 
a while ago with the Western Governors Association on something called chats, which were essentially sort of a, like a system by which they were collecting a lot of data. Um, and I think some parks have been able to hook into those or had at the time been able to hook into those, just the sort of the Western parks. Brian? Yeah. Brian, this is Jeff. I'd just like to interject. Um, yeah. If there's some park personnel that are on the call and they're having a problem um, with wildlife issues on roadways, um, you know, MPCA uh, has staff in the Southeast Regional Office, but we also have folks around the country who have been working on some of these issues. So if it would help to, um, to collaborate, I would encourage that folks reach out to me and I might be able to connect them with one of my colleagues in their region who might be able to assist either connecting to other collaborators or providing facilitation assistance. Um, it's all capacity dependent, but um, I'd be happy to facilitate connections with my colleagues around the country to, um, to park personnel, if that helps. Yeah, that's excellent. And everyone can see just email there on the screen. All right, looks like I've got one more here. Um, yeah, are there parks that have restoration opportunities that may be candidate projects to offset impacts associated with infrastructure projects? If, I'm sorry, if parks have restoration opportunities that may be candidates projects to offset impacts associated with infra infrastructure projects, how can NPS units make ecological teams slash efforts in the region aware of these opportunities to help streamline the project projects incurring unavoidable impacts? So without knowing who answer who asked the question, I would say that um, this is something that Amanda Hardy and um, the other folks at Federal Highway have been chatting about is a little bit how to how to take these opportunities and turn them into you know something that's actionable on the ground. One thing that can be sort of a takeaway for us from this conversation and from this question is just that there seems to be a great opportunity to try and have some coordination also with Federal Lands Highway, who you guys often interface with, to try and figure out how we can really capitalize on these opportunities. Um, you know, I saying like, call up your state DOT is not a satisfying answer. Um, but, but I think that, you know, between the environment folks at Federal Highway, the Federal Lands Highway, and, you know, either individual parks or regions who are really interested in collaborating in this way, we should be able to connect the dots to make these kinds of efforts happen. Excellent. All right, well, um, thank you so much, guys. That was an excellent presentation, and um, there's so much uh, opportunity here, obviously, for um, Park Service to partner with you all. and. Uh, I know, obviously, again, you guys are working with Amanda Hardy and the, with the Park Service, but um, and partners like Jeff. But uh, it's just, just, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more interest and opportunity out there between other Park Service staff and other uh, partners um, and, and, and stakeholders. So this is just fantastic. Um, I. Folks, I, I did just put in the chat box uh, a link to our next um, Connected Conservation webinar. Uh, it's on July 17 at 3 o'clock, and it's on Conserving the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. And we'll have, it's a joint presentation by the Park Service and the uh, Trail of Tears uh, uh, Association. So you, won't, you don't want to miss that. And um, before we close out, um, um, Julianne uh, and Patrick, Angela, Jeff, any closing uh, final thoughts? We really just, just a thank you from Jeff. <laughs> um, and similar from us, we really appreciate the opportunity to share this program with you. We look forward to future dialogue on the subject, um, and we hope that you have a great day. Great. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.